Okay, so I am super excited about this topic. Uh, that is also a scary topic, yet also kind of, it seems like a boring one on paper. The, uh, the art of practicing and the art of practicing well. Um, okay, so Drew, I just got your message here. The meeting, I, I can't call in. Um, let me get you the invite here. Hang on a second. Participants, where is it? How do I, hang on one second, Drew. Copy invitation to Drew. Okay, I just sent it to you. That should work now. Um, okay. As I was saying, the art of practicing and all the bad with it. So, um, it's a scary kind of topic, and I wanted to just break down a lot of barriers. I want us to have like an open, fun discussion about what practicing actually is. Honestly, when I think of that word practice, I get chills. Like it doesn't feel good to say that word. Uh, so I'm not going to lie to you. This is a good topic for all of us. I think it's going to be very therapeutic. So first things first, I'm going to share my with everyone just if you can open the document so you can see what I'm looking at here this is the first document um, that we are going to be jumping into so why talk about practice the first reason is obvious well we're all part of the orchestra so practicing is kind of hopefully uh, a, a part of your orchestral experience okay uh, the second one as musicians I think we've all kind of been so slowly conditioned uh, on the idea of improvement, that practice makes something better. And so the idea of practice also has tur turned into improvement in general. I already mentioned the idea that practice has a lot of baggage attached to it. So, you know, maybe we can break down some of those walls to make it more fun or easier or better. Um, what else here? Efficiency. You know, in today's world, Obviously, not many of us in the orchestra are pro musicians, and even if you are, your time is limited uh, in the course of a day. You know, it's funny because when uh, when this COVID nineteen shutdown was happening, everything was getting canceled. I thought the first thought I had was, "Man, that's great! I'm going to have like twelve hours a day to practice." And then, like, life happened, and house projects happened, and you have to worry about your finances, and then, hey, my car, and all these things. And so, before you know it you know, you're kind of in this cycle of like, man, there's just so many things in life. There's so many priorities. I got to cook dinner. I have to hang out with my wife or husband or significant other, whatever. And, you know, so really, how can we maximize our time? Because not all of us have hours a day to practice, nor should we. So um, the next thing is career moves. Many of us um, who haven't already may be in the future sometime taking an audition. Um, and so, the art of practicing also speaks directly to that. I, I don't think we're going to have time to cover specifically how to audition today because that's a whole big topic in and of itself. So I wanted to use today as a kind of step into auditions. Maybe that'll be our next topic. I actually got feedback back from like four or five of my friend musicians. So that's going to be really better. But anyway, um, and then the sixth point here, highly effective people, the art of practicing Really, if, if you understand practice, what that mental idea actually is, I think it also transforms you into a very effective human being. Um, just the discipline, the willpower, motivation, all these things, they're, they're all wrapped up in the idea of practice. Um, passing it on. A lot of us are teachers or educators or we teach privately. So what we do is subconsciously going to transfer on to others. Even if it's not directly in our lessons or in our classrooms, how we, how we go about our routine or our process is going to affect others, undoubtedly. So um, I have two word docs I'm gonna be going back and forth between. So this is a time for figure one, Q figure one, all right. Figure one, performance and practice. I think we've all seen this one before. It's the one that took down the Titanic. Um, but on a serious note, I mean, this is really a true representation. Anytime we get, we know that when we get out on stage to perform a concert, this is what the audience sees and this is what we all feel and think and have felt and oh my gosh, I'm so exhausted. How can we, I can't even perform well. It, you get what I'm saying. P practice is performance. How we practice is how we perform. Um, so that's just a little, little humor, but also kind of true. So the first thing I want to, I want to ask is, do we enjoy practicing? And I know that I'm asking a very 
difficult question, but do you enjoy practicing? Um, and f feel free to just chime in. I'm curious what your thoughts are. I, I want this to be kind of a discussion as much as it is me giving a presentation about this because I want this to be, I want it to be helpful on a lot of different fronts. So the first, I think, thought process I had was do we all enjoy it or not? And that's okay if you don't. It's okay if you don't even practice, honestly. I'm just curious to know where everyone's at. So just let me know. And you can tell me if you do or if you don't and the reasons why. I'd be very curious. Anyone, just make sure to unmute yourself if you're gonna try to speak. Otherwise, I can't hear you. No one, no one's brave enough, I see. Uh-huh, uh-huh, all right. No one's, I see. Everyone's too scared to tell you. Um, I would say, like, I like practicing only on songs that I like, I guess. It makes them um, different. Um, but the more difficult, challenging songs, um, it takes a while. Okay. Into the groove of wanting to practice it. Sure. So, yeah. okay. that's, that's awesome. you know, I love that you said that. Um, that's actually that's actually really great because it, it leads into a topic I'm going to cover in a little bit. So that's perfect that you said that. And it's true for a lot of us, honestly, that um, we enjoy practicing what is fun. Like I love playing Billy Joel. I love playing Coldplay on the piano. I love playing some. I mean, honestly, I just learned you know that song "Say Something." I love that song. So I just learned how to play that the other day just because I wanted to. I love doing that, as we all do. And that's great because there should be no difference between that, what we love playing, and what we don't love playing as much. So um, that's a great point. Thank you, Ayuna. Anyone else? I think that going off of that one too, that, you know, we – it, while yes, it is, you know, we, we try to have those, ex, those feelings and relationships with the fun stuff that we do like to practice, you know, it's, we also have to, we also have to define in a sense of what practice is. Sure. You know, practice is not necessarily a run through. Practice is not just, oh, you know, I'll take five minutes, do what I want to do, and then, okay, I guess I'm done for today. You know, the, the deliberate practice is something that you know really does set apart and it's something that you uh, you know you learn in those like over the top fields such as college you know such as that that beyond point you know um and you know while yes like you said earlier we would all love to take as much time as we have right now to do that you know we i can't deliberately practice for three hours a day as much as i would love to um, so, you know, trying to, trying to make practice, deliberate practice, while also being efficient for the stuff that we enjoy is where it really starts going into more advanced skills. Yes, it does. And Andrew, that is honestly, I think the hardest part is making the things deliberate also be enjoyable, but also efficient. And that this, it's like the, the miracle formula. Um, so just to really quickly, I see uh, Sandy and Rob, I'm not sure if it's either of you or both of you on the call, but thank you. You said, I work to make it enjoyable and setting specific goals. Yeah, I definitely work to make it enjoyable as well, for sure. Um, setting goals is very, a very good point, and we're going to get into that as well. Um, that's, that can be a, a great thing and also mm, maybe dangerous. We'll talk about that. Um, and then Drew, you said you do, you do enjoy it. It's meditative. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, sometimes when I get in the zone too, it is, there's no better thing. Um, I think there's a puzzle. I think I think it's better. Yeah, for sure. It's almost like a, it is a puzzle, honestly, sometimes. How do, how do I make it better? How do I keep improving? Or how do I work on this one thing to make it better? It's definitely a puzzle in those regards. Um, so thank you for that. That's, that's awesome feedback too. Um, so Andrew, you raised an important point. And that is, what is, what is practice? Um, the definition is uh, the actual application of an idea of improvement versus the theories relating to it. That is like the, the formal definition of, of the word practice. Um, I'm going to jump, jump back into my Word doc here so we can uh, do that. Uh -huh. Where are we? Here we go. Um, 
Yeah, and so I think the very word implies work. You know, when, you, when you say the word practice, it's not I'm playing. You know, I think we often get, can, there's potentially, in, uh, maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a difference in language, um, but I think the, the very word itself is, is trepidatious. I mean, when we say that I'm playing something, like for example, I know many of us in the orchestra are avid gamers. And you know, those of you that may not have experience playing video games, I'll just tell you, gamers, when they, when they, when they game, they always say, hey, yeah, I'm playing blank. I'm playing FIFA or I'm playing something. They always say I'm playing. And when you talk to, uh, to, the, to esports gamers, so, the, so guys that make video gaming a profession, they even say when they're playing 12 hours a day, oh yeah, I'm playing Fortnite today. Even when they're saying they're practicing, they're saying they're playing. So the very difference in words that we use is often, I think, a source of a lot of that wall forming. Uh, also for the fact that we have, when we, were, when we grew up, we had a model of what practice was. We were told that this is what practice is. Um, and so we have, we have that experience in our side, but also we have um, what we have personally brought to the table, our own ideas about what practice is. And so the word takes on a lot of meaning. And there's also a lot of guilt involved in practice. Like if you don't practice, it's almost like a shame thing. Like, A, you feel it yourself, but also, man, like somebody else does. And like those of you that play in string sections know that like if you show up to a rehearsal and you haven't practiced all week, you're sitting there thinking like, oh man, my stand partner's gonna know. Oh, conductor's gonna hear me, it's gonna be awkward. And you can't really fake it and it becomes a guilt thing. It becomes like a self like deprecation thing. And that's not good either. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to ask that very important, very big question. So uh, let's, let's dive into the next thing here. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen here. All right, so the next thing I had here was a, a, a segue, was if you don't enjoy practice, do you know why? And the reason why I asked that is because how many of us have spent time, like sat down with our thoughts and minds and like actually written out or just recorded yourself speaking about why is it that I don't enjoy practice? And it can be a very long thought process. Um, I did that for myself a few years ago and I was shocked to see where that conversation went in my mind. Uh, because at that point, I didn't enjoy practicing. I hadn't played anything on the piano that was for me in a really long time. I really lost sight of why I was doing it. I was learning things because I had to, because I was getting paid to, and because I, I got hired to do so. But man, when's the last time I sat down and just like improvised or played something because I wanted to? And so I had a discussion with myself and it was, about a self-awareness piece. Do I know why I don't enjoy practicing? Um, if you don't enjoy practicing, I would encourage you to do that uh, once we get off the phone call uh, here or the Zoom, whatever you wanna call it, the Zoom call. Because I think it's an important, it's an important concept to know. Um, how self-aware are you about that? Um, I, won't, I won't ask anyone to you know, say, say why you don't or anything like that, but it's a topic I, I urge you all to explore. Um, I think you'll be surprised at where that thought process goes. For me, I will be open and honest with you all because I think that's very important. Transparency is good. I you know, like I, like I just said a few years ago, I didn't enjoy practicing. I realized that my thoughts on practice were directly tied to my thoughts of where I was in my life at that point. At that point, I was not happy with where I was. I felt stuck. I felt like I was at a dead end. I felt like I was not going anywhere in whatever facet of life you wanna say. And I realized, my goodness, it's the same thing. So for me, practice is directly tied to how I feel or how I am, how I really am in my daily life. Um, that's very important for me to be aware of because I know that if I'm not doing great every day, my playing and therefore my conducting, my studying, whatever, is also probably gonna suffer. So for me, it's very important. Why? Because then I can find a way to balance those things out. Um, and so it will we'll touch on those uh, points in a little bit, the idea of balance. But um, I also want to touch on a point that Miss Madeline Bruiser talks about in her book that I have up here. It's called The Art of Practicing that we're going to actually dive into a bit. 
And this is on page 151, on the beginning of chapter eight. Yay. Um, she talks about the three things. There are three, what she, well, not she, but psychologists, what they refer to as psychological habits called the styles of struggle. Why do we struggle to practice? Um, and there are three of them, and we'll get into them in a little bit, but um, I wrote them out here, overstated passion, avoidance, and aggression. And those sound really like, oh my gosh, that's deep. We're getting into some, some territory. Don't worry, it won't be that bad. Um, but the point is that there's a lot of facets that, that can be involved if, uh, with the simple fact of like, you know, I didn't, I didn't practice this week. That's okay. First of all, don't beat yourself up about it. We've all been there. Even those people that, that have said that, no, I've never missed a day of practice in my life. Yeah, they have. Um, so first of all, take it easy. All right. Second of all, I, you know, this is a good question because I, I, I think it's important too. What do you find yourself doing for hours a day that you get enjoyment out of? Um, and th that's an important piece also to talk about. Um, you know, it's, it's, what do you like, without thinking about it, I think that's what I wanted to ask, without even realizing you're doing it, what are you doing for hours a day, or maybe just two hours a day or an hour a day, that you just get so much joy out of that you're not like, I'm going to consciously do blank because I love doing blank. You know, how many of us have those things? For me, I know what those three things are. For me, it's reading at the end of a night, or at the end of the day, rather, beginning of the night, whatever. Um, I actually really do enjoy playing video games, and I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, that's therapeutic for me. The third thing is cooking. I love making stuff up. I really wanted to start a YouTube channel called What's in Voitex Fridge, because I invent some weird stuff, but I enjoy that. It's like a puzzle for me. It's like a food puzzle. But I don't think about doing those things. I just do them, and they make me happy. Is music the same way? Is practice the same way for you? Um, and so I, I urge you to find connections between practice and the things you subconsciously do during a day, because I think you'll be surprised at what you find. Um, and I just gave you some examples here of what those things are working out as a chore for me. But anyway, um, okay. It, this is a really cool question that I also, oh, what happened? That I really enjoy. Is practicing music all that different from practicing anything else? Hmm, interesting question, because the very word performance exists in a lot of different areas of life. Um, for example, in business, there is an idea of optimal performance that is, a, that is a key component of operations management. Those of you that have taken MBA coursework will know what I'm talking about. Um, and I actually, let's look at figure two here. Um, this is a really cool chart. This is from, I just pulled this off of a I forget what the title of the presentation was, but it's basically, it was a business style seminar. And this was the chart that they showed. And they used athletes as an example. Athletes train 90% of the time, they perform 10% of the time, what we see you know, at games or uh, whatever. And then they did the, the exact opposite for the business world. And they realized that in the business world, they, perf they, are, they perform 99% of the time they have to be at optimal performance conditions 99% of the time. And the training is so minimal, it's almost barely on the graph. To give you a case in point example, uh, my girlfriend is a target executive. She works in retail um, and she, she, she has her business degree. I asked her about this and she was like, okay, that's, that's way too like, that's, she felt attacked by this chart because it's true because you know the, the the world of retail especially and hospitality is another one they expect you to be on your a game a thousand percent of the time there is no room for error money is involved so they want you to be at performance standards but yet you always seem to hear about and this is true for any a lot of these industries that corporate life especially is the training is so minimal you're just supposed to jump in and know how to do stuff how so the idea of practice and performance in business is very different, obviously, than it is for us, but the correlation there is interesting that they also use similar terminology, yet the, it's so flipped, isn't it? Um, how can you perform well if you're not trained? Anyway, uh, okay, let's just dive into back to number three here. Hang on, I'm getting checks. All right, okay, Savannah, I'll read that in a second. Josh, I'll read that in a second too. Um, okay. 
sports and athletes, we, we, you know, we, I think that's the, the easiest one we always identify music with is the idea of athletes training and working out 12 hours a day, musicians training 12 hours a day. It's the one that seems to be most um, closely related, I guess you could say. So I wanted to bring that up too. Um, and so the first one, first example I have for you is Kobe Bryant. Now, I, it recently, obviously he passed away. Um, and I know that he had some whatever struggles in his life. I, whatever, I don't care about that. The point that I want to make is his mentality. Um, and something that he preaches and, and something I actually put here in figure three. Um, and it's this, his mantra, the Mamba mentality, which is what kind of, he was, he was known as the black Mamba for those of you that don't know. Um, just relentless work ethic, just absolutely relentless. And he has a great quote here. Mamba mentality is all about focusing on the process and trusting in the hard work when it matters most. I mean, you can slap any, any classical name on there, you know, uh, Hillary Hahn, you can slap Daniel Barenboim on there. I'm pretty sure it's all about the same idea. It's a very cross, cross universe parallel there. Um, if you ever watch, you know, Kobe play or, or rehearse or rehearse while wow, practice, whew, that just happened. Um, or any pro athlete that's at the top of their game. I bet you this is a tenant that they live by, but Kobe was especially famous for it. the famous story of him. I think it was shooting, what is it? A thousand sh uh, free throws after one game. Uh, Cause he missed like three that game. And he was known for like his 95% free throw rate. Um, just relentless work ethic. And it's what drove him. Um, here's another great quote from a famous, I guess you could call him an athlete. I did Bruce Lee. Um, very different arena, but he said, in performance, you can only be as half as good as you are in practice. Now, that's very interesting. There's a lot in, that's wrapped up in that quote because there's so many more factors that come into play during a performance, quote unquote, or in audition, quote unquote, which is the same thing, by the way. Um, but you can only be half as good. Why? There are so many other factors at play in a performance, such as well, there's brand new lighting. There's an audience that's watching me. I feel nerves and tension. Uh, these surroundings are different. I'm probably wearing different clothes. I mean, add in 17 different things and it's going to be a different situation. So just factor that into that. You're only half as good as your preparation, essentially is what he's saying. Um, so for him, this is what drove him through the wall. He wanted to be the best martial artist that, that ever lived basically. So he knew to get to that point, his goal, he visualized that I need to work harder than everyone else. Therefore, you know, even, even if I outwork everyone, I'm still gonna only probably perform here. So maybe we haven't even seen his full potential. The point is the, the better we practice, the better we perform. That's, this is obvious, obviously. And, and athletes know it better. You don't make it in the sports world unless you've prepared the right way. And then we all know that the same in music, but the same in really any industry. The third example I wanted to use is Tiger Woods. And this is a fascinating example um, because we, Tiger is one of those prodigies. And you know, when we hear of Tiger Woods as a kid or in his youth, we often hear these stories of like, man, you know, I, as soon as he picked up a golf club, he just like knew how to hit that ball like so well. I, it's just like magic. We often hear a lot of the same things with child prodigies in music or old genius composers, such as, have you ever heard the, the tales of Mozart that he just spit out symphonies? I mean, they just flew, flew out of his head and the paper, stagecoach ride to Paris. You got it, Symphony 37, bang, there we go without missing a note, without crossing anything out, that there was this like this genius factor there. What I love is how untrue that is for both Tiger Woods and for Mozart. And there is a great book that I highly encourage you all to get. Talent is overrated. And I'm going to just show you really quickly. Oh, this is the other document that we have. Are you going to go through here? But for those that are interested, it's by Jeff Colvin. It's called Talent is Overrated. Uh, if you have read it, you know what I'm talking about. He basically destroys the myth of talent and what that actually is. Um, those of you that haven't read it, I, go get it. It is probably one of the best reads I've ever had in my life, and it is worth $4. You can buy this like knowledge for $4. I, I love it. 
Um, okay, we'll get to that doc in a second. Um, but I also, if you struggle with getting yourself to practice, if you feel that you are ill-prepared, if you didn't have enough training, if you feel like it's just you're never going to catch up to this person or be as good as this person, if, if, if it just seems like an unattainable goal to improve, please read that book. It will motivate you. It will make you feel better, more confident, I promise you. And it is a quick read. I read it in two days, and I'm a slow reader. Um, but it's also fascinating to read Tiger Woods and then Mozart and then Warren Buffett. Anyway, uh, great book. Uh, next thing, I also already men mentioned gamers. Uh, the most famous uh, gamer out there right now is probably Ninja. You may have heard of him with his, with his bright hair that keeps changing colors. But he, he, he made his career playing Fortnite. Those of you that don't know, it's just a very famous game. Don't worry about it. But the point is, um, he did an interview a few months ago that I watched. Uh, I just was fascinated to, to know. He was really the first like pro esports athlete to make it huge. And I always, I always wondered why. And so I was fascinated to watch this interview with him where he reportedly plays an average of 12 hours a day. Now, you, you, it, it's interesting because if you were to say that a musician practices 12 hours a day, everybody would be like, well, no, they're only two hours short of making it to the New York Phil. Cool. Oh, well, they got to just keep practicing. But then you talk about Ninja playing 12 hours a day and it's an addiction and it's a mental health disorder. So it's, it's interesting what the stigmas are between the two. Um, at, but I think the idea of practice for him or playing the game, look at the similarities. He plays 12 hours a day and has become the best in the world. Now, not anymore, arguably, but he was the first pioneer. He was, is what like, created this massive industry for Fortnite. Um, so the idea of him practicing this much, but it's playing, there's similarities in the gaming world to what music is. How many of you that have played video games know that if you play like two to three hours of blank a game, you're going to get better at it and you enjoy doing it, but without thinking about it, you're getting better at it. Um, which is an interesting parallel that no one ever really talks about between video gaming and, and music. Um, figure four, I don't even know what figure four is. Let's see what figure four is. Figure four. Oh yes, so this is from another article that I pulled uh, about, I forget his name, was it Jay Dong? Uh, he was the League of Legends champion or something like that, but um, it's a great quote. The world of esports is demanding both physically and mentally. Professional gamers barely passed their teens, hint, hint, child prodigy in the music world, burn out even faster than athletes, like pro athletes. Top competitors are playing 12 to 14 hours a day, at least six days a week according to Richard Lewis, who's a journalist. I mean, put that into perspective. That means they're playing minimum 72 to what's it, 84 hours a week, just, just doing that. And so, you know, we talk about the 40 hour work week in just a regular everyday life. They're doing 84, or on average, we can say 80. Sure, double that. Um, and this is what they do. Interesting parallel again. Um, actors as another, another great parallel to practicing. Um, especially method actors. How many of us have heard the story of Heath Ledger and what he did on The Dark Knight? Yes, tragic and yes, so sad. But his process was to do it every single minute of the day. Now, that's out of balance, obviously. And you can argue that the gaming uh, example I just gave is also a bit out of balance and out of whack. But the point being that they invested themselves fully into what they were doing because that's just what they needed to do. Daniel Day-Lewis is another prime example of a method actor who just, it just constantly, constantly works on their craft. What Daniel Day-Lewis is famous for, if you're not aware of this, go check out some videos. There's a great um, series of videos that, his name is Eric Singer, and he does them on YouTube. He's a dialect and vocal coach. Um, and basically he analyzes what Daniel Day-Lewis does to prepare for a role as far as speaking, speech, certain accents, dialects, and how endless that process is for him. And the more he studies the culture and the history and all this, it wraps him up into this bubble of that character and the persona. Um, again, an industry where if you spend blank amount of time, it seems, you're just better at it. But there's a really, there's a really interesting stopping point here because in all of these 
in all of these five examples I've given you, or four, however many, business, uh, sports, gaming, and acting, the idea of time seems to come up over and over and over and over again. Um, and the idea becomes born that if I practice a lot, I will get better. And many musicians find themselves frustrated that they spend two to three or four hours practicing. And A, it's not fun. They feel like they haven't gotten anywhere. They feel like they've wasted their time. And at the end of the week, they've put in 20 to 40 hours of practice and haven't gotten any better. We've all been there. We've all experienced that. And I think there's, there's a very important note to make here that time does not make you better. The amount of time you spend practicing does not make you better. I'm going to say that just loud and clear. It's something I live by, and it's something that shocked me when I first read it. And when I first read that was in a book, uh, you may have heard of him. His name is Daniel Barenboim. Yeah, that guy, the one who can play all 32 piano sonatas by Beethoven from memory and, you know, Chicago Symphony, all that, you know, whatever. He barely made it as a musician, right? But uh, in his book uh, that I also left you in this Excel doc, uh, this whole, like, check out this section is pretty much like my favorite books of all time, I think. Um, but this, his book, it's called A Life in Music, and it's just a biography. And I just picked it up one day. I was bored. I was like, whatever. I don't know. It was Barnes and Noble, and it was available, so I bought it. Um, but I started reading it. I, I'll fully admit I didn't finish the book, but I got about halfway through. But um, even getting halfway through, I learned a lot of lessons. The most valuable one was it was the first time in my life, mind you, at this point, I'm 20 years old, where I heard for the first time that time does not make you better. I was 20. And so mind you, I've been playing music for about 12 years at this point. So 12 years of reinforcement that time makes me better. I did not like practicing because I felt like I wasn't getting better the more time I put in. It was just making me worse. And finally, it was like a light bulb. It was like a revelation. And he was the first one that talks about how his mental approach to music is so much more important than the physical approach to music. And we're going to just dive into that in a second. But I wanted to bring that up because um, I think it's an important thing. Uh, those of you that are wondering about this, I, I kept this document up for a second, so I'm sure you read about it. Th these are, I, I compiled a list of like so many sources, but basically I went through all of the tips that you're given to try to make practice better and easier. And then I like just cross correlated how many times it appears. And anyway, I'm a nerd. You get the idea, but uh, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. The why. First of all, let's talk about why we practice because to have the idea of practicing as a exercise of time or duty is not going to get you anywhere. And in fact, it's very much familiar because I feel like I saw a movie about this guy, Forrest Gump. I just felt like running. Such a famous quote. I love this whole montage in the movie. Those of you that have seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you that haven't seen it, don't worry, I'm not ruining anything for you. But basically, Forrest Gump one, one day just decides to get up off of his porch. I kid you not, just gets up off of his porch, starts to run. He runs to his front, front fence. And then he's like, well, I got there. And I was like, I'll just keep going. So he gets to the bridge and then the county line, the town line, the rest is history. It's like a whole like montage in the movie. And I love, you know, when I first saw the movie, I was like, man, this is amazing. I love this. But then I, I thought about that as, as to how it related to music. It was a thought that popped into my head. And I was like, man, that sounds like practice. You just kind of do it and you go and you, and you run. And you just, the, the longer you go, the more you think like, man, I'm getting somewhere. And then you literally, I think at this point in the movie, he stops, turns around. And he's like, I think I'm, I think I'm gonna go home now. And it hit me like a light bulb when I was thinking about practice. I was like, oh my gosh, that is literally, literally the quintessential idea of when you realize oh, I shouldn't be just like throwing in countless endless hours into this thing that I have no idea what I'm doing. Self-awareness point right here. Let's talk about self-awareness. Am I self-aware of why I'm practicing? So don't be like Forrest Gump. Know why you're practicing. Why, why, why am I here? Why did I sit down to my piano or to my bass or to my viola or to whatever you're playing? Why am I here? What am I doing? Um, and that's, an, again, another one of these things that is, that is a very important piece of self-reflection that I urge you all to pursue once we're out of the Zoom or whenever you have a minute, you know, tonight over dinner or something, 
just, just think about this point. Why do you sit down? Is it because someone asked you to? Because you're forced by a deadline or an audition or you have to prepare for a concert? Is it something that's put on you by an external factor or is it something internal that drives you? Um, really know why. But once you've done that, identify your goals because practicing can be fun and it should be fun. So potentially, you know, I think, you know, you said it, uh, you said it when you said, um, I love playing the things that give me joy. Great. Make that part of your daily practice. Why not? That makes you happy. Build it in. And I think that's an important component of balance in practice. Play the things you enjoy. For others, I'll be honest, like for me, I need to do that maybe once or twice a week. The rest of the time, I get a lot of joy out of just woodshedding parts. I just love it now. But that's not everyone. And so each one of us is different as a human being. We come from different places, different backgrounds, different upbringings, different everything. And so where we are in life is not a cookie cutter, like this is how you practice. <laughs> Here you go. We're all different and we have different things to bring to the table. We enjoy different things. Let that be a part of your practice. But one thing that does hold true is the idea of goals always seems to come up when we talk about practice. Am I preparing for a concert or am I preparing for myself? Those are two very different things. And you know, I, when I was first pre preparing this presentation, I actually was really excited to talk about how good goals are. And then I realized that can be also a very bad thing. And how, how can a goal be a bad thing? Because if the goal starts to drive your practice, then you lose sight of why you're actually doing it. Because then it becomes about the goal, about the end product versus the process. I'm gonna go back to Mamba mentality for a second. The process. It's not about the goal, it's the process. And Co what Kobe, why I think he succeeded more than most is because for him, he never lost sight of the process. Um, Okay, so that being said, just be really mindful that, you know, just hang on a second, uh, here we go. Okay, um, the idea that practice should grow you as a human being, I think is way more important than I'm gonna play this piece really well. Because you may play that piece very well, but man, are you like a really, are, are you just not happy as a human being right now because you just spent 70 hours this week doing it and you really don't like yourself because you like totally you know skirted your commitments to your partner or like to your job or your life does that sound familiar at all if it does then i urge you to search for your inner personal growth in playing music because it should always do that i lost sight of it for myself when i realized the whole reason i got into music i got into music because i loved playing the things i enjoyed listening to and hearing and that's a very important component because what, what I got into music for wasn't necessarily Chopin, Beethoven, and Brahms. I've come to love those composers, of course, as you all know, but what got me into music was more like Billy Joel and Brian Adams. Yeah, I know, Brian Adams, Canadian rock legend, but uh, like those kind of things. And I started at the piano after I got like the first like four lessons under my hands, I was like, man, I'm gonna go learn some Billy Joel and some Brian Adams, whatever I could play at that, technically at that point, I did, because I loved it. And so I realized when I cut that out of my practicing, that was a part of my personal growth I was cutting out. And so now I'm using myself as an example for you all, but I urge you all to find your, the end goal should be the process of personal growth for you all. It was in my personal opinion, take it for what you will. I just think it's a healthier thing than having blank goal as the goal because okay, let's just hypothetically say you achieve the goal. What happens after that? Let's just say that you're preparing for an audition and the audition is six months away. I want you to ask yourself that hypothetical question. You now have come up with a plan, a beautiful rubric, like I'm gonna practice blank this day and I know this action's really hard, I'm gonna do this. Let's say you do all that, great. And you get to the audition and you win the audition. And then what? What's motivating you to keep going after that? The next audition? What if there is no audition? What if you slip up and then you get fired because you haven't been putting in the work you did for the audition? Do you see my point? I think that's happened to many of us is that we, music or whatever else you wanna cor correlate it to, 
when you lose sight of why you're doing it for yourself, it becomes a problem. And the people I've talked to um, that have won auditions, it's, it's not even a question that I ask them because it's, 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 I don't even know if people think on that level that I, I'm, I'm weird. But, you know, I started realizing that those people that have won auditions, it's not because they prepared that excerpt for the best. Because arguably they may not have, but what they have done is found a piece inside of themselves to practice certain things in a certain way that still brings them joy, but grows them as humans and musicians. Practice is also a, pra uh, a practice, for lack of a better word, of self-discipline, of motivation, of willpower. Um, and these are important words you hear in, in martial arts all the time, the idea of self-discipline. Um, and like, this is what it grows in you and uh, meditation, all these things. But don't lose sight of that. I urge you all. Uh, personal growth is way more important than the goal. So if, if fun is your goal, great. Keep doing it. Whatever makes the most fun for you. Because I guarantee you, once you start playing, what song is it? Oh, maybe you like Maroon 5. Uh, they have a new song on the radio that sounds an awfully suspicious bit like Pocketball's Cannon. If you know what I'm talking about, then it's gonna make you want to go research Pocketbells Cannon. Guess what you're gonna pr probably play next after that? Pocketbells Cannon. So don't close yourself off from the things that give you the most joy, is basically my whole spiel as to why. And I didn't realize I was so passionate about step five because I, you know, kind of got stuck on that topic. But the point is, your why is not everyone else's why. Your personal growth is not everyone else's personal growth. But do the things that give you joy, yet still motivate you to keep going and getting better. Um, now let's talk about the what. We talked about the, the why, but now the what. So what are you working on? Is it excerpts, pieces, orchestral parts? What are you doing every day? Are you out of balance in what you want to do? Again, another self-reflective piece. Just think about it for yourself. And, you know, th this comes back to the idea of when I was practicing excerpts eight hours a day, was I happy? No, because I got so tunnel visioned and I just didn't even realize that anything in the world existed like, hey, the pop music that makes me happy. It's going to influence how you play. And believe it or not, I had one of those moments uh, a few days ago. I was watching The Voice and I didn't intend to. I had it on in the background. I was making dinner and I had The Voice on. And I was, just, I forget who it was. I want to say it was Kelly Clarkson that was coaching. It was Kelly Clarkson that was coaching the singers. And she said something that kind of stuck with me. She said, you know, in this moment right here, uh, the girl was singing her song and she said, you know, just, just stop right here and just let that pain sink in and, and then sing that word. And I thought how simple that was. And I was like, what's she talking about? And then I sat down at my piano when I did that and I realized, oh man, she's right. Like, and I've lost sight of that. Like, man, just be in the moment. Okay, cool. But the point is, your the what that you're doing every day should be again a reflection of who you are and who you want to be where you want to get to what you're working on um mm. just keep it in mind think about that think do it with, with it what you will and so the how this is the hardest part of this whole thing is how do i do that how do i do it healthily and how do i do it well and efficiently and all this stuff so there was a great case study done a few years ago and I'm actually going to show you the article itself. It's actually not a long article. Those of you that are curious, it's about, okay, it's deceptive. It's about 10 pages long because the references are two pages. But it's a study called, it's not how much, it's how. Characteristics of practice behavior and retention of performance skills. Now, it's a journalism of re, the Journal of Research and Music Education. I forget what year, 2009. Um, done by these three folks right here. And it's a famous study, you may have heard of it. Uh, it's called the Shostakovich study now. Um, so let's just talk about, oh, I didn't mean to exit that. Can I get it back? No, all right, that's okay. Um, all right, well, it's, it's fine, it's in the figures. So let's talk about this. So the, I'll set it up for you. Basically what the study was, they brought in 17 pianists um, from, I believe it was University of Texas, and they had them work on an excerpt of Shostakovich's Piano Concerto Number no. 1. And it was an excerpt that they chose specifically because it wasn't too hard, it wasn't too easy. You could basically learn it in one practice session. And the goal was for them to spend, I forget the amount of time, on that excerpt to learn it in one day 
come back the next day and sit down and perform it. And what their goal was in studying this was to see who did what in the practice time that retained the most information that led to a more successful performance the next day. So basically, what was the most efficient method of practice that was also most helpful in retention that you could then build on the following day? Because if you come in the next day and you did it better, that's going to just maybe grow you a little bit there. So we're talking about technical growth right now. I know that. But I wanted to just give this uh, case study as a, as a lead into it. This is, oh, hang on. I'm not sharing my screen anymore. Let me share. This is the excerpt in question here. Figure number one from concerto number one. So looking at it on paper, as a pianist, I can tell you, okay, it looks, it, it's weird. It's definitely weird, but there's patterns here. I see down, up, down, up, down, down. There's patterns, okay, this is, okay, a scale of some weird variety. I just gotta figure out what that scale is. But they're right. It's not anything that I wouldn't be able to do in one session. So this is the 17 of them, mind you, 17 pianists. And what they found, was that three of them came in the next day and basically played it perfectly. Two of them did it for memory after not having seen it like for 24 hours. Interesting. So then they started going through who did what the best um, and they ranked them in order of uh, you know, accuracy and things like that. And where is that document? Oh my goodness, the preview hanging on open recent, beautiful. Um, and so I, it's a chart here and I can send this to you if you're curious, but basically they laid it all out. And here's the chart. It's like they identified 11 different things that each of them did, 11 different practice strategies that each of them tried to work on this excerpt, and how many trials they had, how many times they did that one thing, how many times they got it correct. It's a whole thing. You're more than welcome to, to check it out, but not the point of this um, for, right, for us right now. What is important is they identified these concepts, these eight concepts as the most effective ways to actually practice efficiently and for retention. Thankfully for you, I've compiled this list in this document right here. There you go, you're welcome. The last three were things done by only the top three performers. So the three that performed the excerpt the best the next day, these three things, letters F, G, and H, are, they were the only ones to try those things which when you read them, it kind of surprises me. The precise location and source of each error was identified accurately, rehearsed, and corrected. Interesting. Only three of them tried that. Letter G, the tempo of individual trials was varied systematically, so they slowed things down a lot, like, like a lot, and then only built it up when they needed to. Okay, the third one, the target passages were repeated until the error was corrected, and the passage was stabilized. Three ideas here. The idea is spot practice, choose the, the hardest spots, and then work them very under tempo, and then repeat that process until it becomes almost calm, honestly. Um, which is funny when you think about it because I feel like that's a very kind of common way to approach practice nowadays. Maybe we've heard that approach. Um, and so I thought, hmm, that's interesting. I wonder how it's going to compare to this chart. This is the chart I just told you about that I compiled of practice tips. And you can try all these out if you want. I, this is definitely like a resource for everyone. But I wanted to, to, to kind of point out what are the most, the ones that come up the most, all right, and across all these different docs. I just did like random Google searches. This is by no means a scientific study but out of curiosity. Number one, practice slowly appears in every single one of these sources. Number two, quality over quantity, meaning your mindset and approach to choosing specific moments to practice, but also focusing on like, hey, there's one spot of four measures that is giving me a lot of trouble. I'm going to focus on that today. And I know that by the end of today, I'll at least understand it and approach it and do it systematically in that regard. Quality, you're choosing your moments. You're not going for learning the entire symphony in one day. That would be unrealistic. But what you are doing is learning those spots. That is the second most appearing 
English is not my first language. That thing comes up the second most frequent, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, it comes up a lot. The third thing is create goals and mini goals, make it manageable. We talked about goals already. Make them fun, make them for you, and make them accessible, make them reachable, make them manageable. The worst thing you can do is end a day of playing on your instrument. I'm gonna call it playing, not practicing. The worst thing you can do is put your instrument down and feel like you didn't accomplish what you set out to do. But guess what, if you accomplish two, let's call them two very manageable goals, and you accomplish them both, is that gonna make you feel better than not reaching that one big goal? Absolutely. It just, it's, it's basic psychology. You're positively reinforcing yourself to reach your goals and make it more fun. Speaking of po positive reinforcement, rewarding yourself also comes up. For example, if I practice and I do this one thing really, really well, I'm gonna go play FIFA for an hour. Good for you, man. You did what you set out to do. I'm happy for you. But before we get to the number fours, we also have number five. Repetition and reinforcement of good habits was a, a key component in many of these sources. So good repetition, healthy repetition, not just repetition, but good, good habit repetition, reinforcement of good things. Um, and then also, oh, practice the sections you can't play very well. Remember that thing those three pianists did in Texas? Yeah, choose your spots, practice the things you can't do. Um, and then we have the reward yourself. Oh yeah, go to live music. Go check out what people are doing. You kind of get stuck in a bubble sometimes. I know I do. When I go sit down at a piano and I'm in my zone, I forget that like a lot of these people can do some really magical things on that same piano that I'm playing on. Go use it as motivation. You know, let it inspire you. Let it just kind of flow through you. One of the coolest motivating things I did this past season, was it this past season, October? Whatever. Um, recently was the, I, I went and I got to work with Black Violin. I'm not sure if you guys know who Black Violin is. There are two violinists um, that, that came, they came through Charleston. I got to conduct um, the Charleston youth kids in a performance with them. Mind you, I only conducted like one piece and it was like four minutes at the end of the whole show. But dang, that thing was fun to be a part of. And it was just motivating. Were they the best technicians on the planet? Oh, but was it inspiring? Absolutely. It got me going. It got me excited. Guess what I did that day? I tried to learn viola. It didn't go very well, but that's, that's for another day. But it got me going. It got me excited. All right. So the point is, I, I have already gone through these things here for you. So I, I've done the work. Try these out. See which one of these you like. Try and see which of these actually mean something to you. And they could be very different. Um, something that I found very interesting was this one. Challenge yourself physically, neural pathway stimulation. And what this basically talks about, and only one of these had it in there, but I, I tried it out after I read it because I was like, That's, that sounds way too cool. It's the idea that you add a physical action in to your playing while practicing something really difficult. And then after you feel like you finally feel comfortable about playing it, you take that physical action away. Hypothetically, if you're playing flute and you normally sit, Stand on one leg and play that same excerpt. Your brain will rec recognize that what you're practicing or playing is not as difficult as it actually is because it has to focus on the other thing you're trying to do. Your brain will then realize, I can do this way more efficiently if you just let me. So actually by distracting your brain in that way, physically, so we're talking physically here, not like watching you know, a movie while you're practicing, but a physical action that your body can focus on. For pianists, it could be playing with your legs up in the air. Um, I, you just find, find a physical thing and let that challenge your neural pathways and then take it away and see how much easier playing that excerpt is gonna be. That's just a really cool one that I liked. Um, so I highlighted it there. What was another one? Yeah, a use of, of a variety of error correction methods. We have always come to be accustomed to like, well, if you do it wrong, go back and do it this way and blah, 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 blah. Guess what, it may not work for me. And it may not work for you either, but I encourage you to find a variety of different ways to fix a problem. One that I love to do is anything I'm working on, if I'm struggling with it, I turn it into a pop song. Somehow, some way, I do it. I will like take the melody and completely butcher the rhythm. I'll make it some lyrical, like Kenny G sounding thing, just because that's like what sticks in my brain. And guess what that's gonna do? It's gonna reinforce where my fingers need to go at least. 
It's going to reinforce how my air is going to flow. I'm thinking about getting good airflow, but I'm just enjoying it. It may be the most difficult thing in the world, but man, I'm going to put it in a different frame of mind. I'm going to correct it the way my brain wants to correct it. Don't be ashamed of that. Go for it. Try it. Why not? Um, okay. Balance is the, is a key thing. It's such a, such a key thing, such a huge concept here. Um, and the idea of balance is very important to us all. I know. Um, I'm going to jump back into this document here. Um, I'm skipping around a little bit, but basically the mechanics, well, I can summarize it very, very quickly. You, do, you don't just sit down at, at your instrument and then like run a marathon. Would you, would you, if, how many of you have run a marathon in your life? Okay. You know that you don't just one day leave the house like Forrest Gump and run across the country. You just don't do it. So why on earth would you sit down and aim to practice for four hours and learn a really hard excerpt? Doesn't make sense. So everything has to be in balance, especially the way you're moving. If, for example, you notice your body is no longer physically capable of practicing, why would you keep going? This again puts that idea of time practice out the window. Don't make it a time thing. Maybe you can only practice for 20 minutes, but if it's a really good 20 minutes, good for you. And also make sure that you're using good proper mechanics. If something hurts, you're doing it wrong. If something doesn't feel good, you're doing it wrong. If your face feels like it's falling off after you've played a wind instrument, maybe you're doing something wrong with your face. Just really be attentive to your mechanics. If something's not working, be aware of it. Self-awareness again, like the seventh time I've said it, and just try to work on that, okay? Um, the piece is not as important as you being healthy and happy, all right? I'll just say that very clearly. All right, balance. There's a really a, a few things in, in this book that are really cool. Um, avoid perfectionism is basically a really important thing. We as musicians get bogged down with the idea of making things perfect or great, or it has to sound blank, or like, oh my gosh, it's going to be rehearsal and like I have to play it perfectly. No, perfect is, is an unattainable thing. The idea of balancing your approach is much more healthy. Um, also regular length, but reasonable breaks. She talks about balance a lot. These two pages actually really stuck out to me. I highlighted them for myself because what she also talks about balance and practice is like literally also a balance in life type of thing. And it's amazing how much of this book she talks about the art of practicing, but it's actually like a really spiritual guide into like self-awareness. Hey, that thing again, balance in practicing is balance in life. You know, make practice enjoyable, but fun, but productive, but efficient. The same thing you're going to do in life. Like hypothetically, you're not going to set out to go to work for eight hours and then you're going to go to the grocery store and then you're going to cook a dinner and then you're going to go work out and then you're going to go do this and you're going to go do that. And it's unattainable. But if you say to yourself, hey, I'm going to focus on this one task really, really well. And when I'm tired, I'll stop. Good. Good for you. Balance. Great. All right. Make sure you have balance in mind because if you don't, you can get hurt and you can get very angry at music. We don't want that. All right. We talked about the three cycles. Um, that she talks about, the, I mentioned them in the beginning, like the psychological barriers. And I wrote them out here, and I wrote them in, in, in detail. Um, but basically, most of us are a complicated blend of these three things. If we feel any sort of animosity towards practicing, we're probably experiencing one of these three things in some facet. Again, she talks about it in a musical sense here, but I couldn't help but think as I was reading these sections, she was talking about life and life tensions and life balance. So the first one is overstated passion, it's called. You're basically overdoing it. Anytime you're emoting too much or you're focusing on getting the expression for this one thing, it's all you care about doing, you're actually missing the point. What that actually is is a mask of your vulnerability. Um, and so it's, it's, the lesson here is letting go of that tension and just allowing the music to flow through you versus trying to show it all because what you're actually doing is masking something. Um, so being aware of that, it, you know, and this may be very subtle and she proposes like doing it really overdone one time at, when you're practicing and then sometimes do it really subtly so you can be aware of what that physical stimulus is. Be aware of that. It's a hard lesson to learn for conductors because for us being on the podium is like true vulnerability. We are in front of all of you and I mean, we have to bear our souls every time we conduct, otherwise it's not an authentic performance. 
And so that's hard. So I'll be fully honest. I don't do that all the time because I'm human and I make mistakes and I just, I don't do that hundred percent of the time. It's not possible. And I know that for me, whenever I don't, it's probably because of this. I'm trying too hard. I'm trying too hard. I overthink and I overdo. I overdo. That's a big problem for me personally. And I know that I have to let go and just be vulnerable. That's very hard to do. Um, but it can be moderation. Use it in balance. Avoidance is another one. This is the also known as I didn't practice for four days. Um, <clears throat> But what it actually is, you can actually be avoiding working on it. So like I just said, you don't practice. Or it can actually be avoiding details in your playing. Or while you're performing, it can be avoiding details. Why? Because on some level, we can either choose to leave things out because it gives us a safety net of like, well, if I really tried, I could do it better. Why didn't you? Or the second thing is your body is too, your mind are too cluttered and worn down and you're trying to do too much and you just can do the details. You're worn out. Guess what that comes back to? A conversation about balance. Hey, all right. Yin and yang, guys. Uh, so just be aware of that. If you're avoiding practicing, don't beat yourself up, but rather make it a self-awareness thing like, am I out of balance? Am I, am I experiencing imbalance in my life? It doesn't have to be that deep. I'm just saying there may be a reason that doesn't have to involve self-guilt. Please do not guilt yourselves for not practicing. Those of you with full-time jobs and families and kids and health and money and all these things that come into your life, you're going to have a lot on your mind and a lot on your plate. Be kind to yourself and practice when you want to, when you can, and in the best, healthiest way you can. All right? I encourage you. Aggression is the last one. Playing with a lot of machismo, as they say, or forcing, or forcing it too much. It's showing everyone that you're in control. And we've all seen this before. It's like, you know, like, I, I just imagine this, like, Soviet pianist at the piano, just, like, fully, like, showing us, like, I got this. You know, hmm, here we go. Hmm, got it. Here we go. Nailed it. But what that actually is, is you're, is you're covering something up. Again, it's an imbalance. And... You know, psychologically speaking, aggression is a symptom of depression. Um, I'm not, I'm not, we're not going to get into that topic here, but just, just be aware that maybe sometimes you're controlling your music too much or playing too much, or when you leave your practice session and you're mad and you're angry, why? Make that, a, make that a point of, of stopping and be like, okay, time out. Let's talk to myself. Am I trying to control things way too much? Believe it or not, this is the number one thing that gets people cut from auditions. The number one thing is trying to control things too much in an audition setting. When you feel like you've completely worked this excerpt perfectly, you know it so well, you feel really good about stuff and you're gonna show them how well you know it. Does that sound familiar at all? The idea of control is actually a mask of vulnerability. It's actually being scared to just allow the music to speak for itself. So again, be mindful of this. Um, those of you that have had auditions and you didn't understand why you didn't get those things, go back and try to like remember those moments. Maybe these three things will help, maybe not. But I hope that these three things will at least help you open your mind up a little bit um, to certain things. Because maybe there's a reason you don't enjoy practicing or you don't even do it. And don't be so hard on yourself. We're all human. We all struggle with things. All right. The last thing we're going to talk about is famous myths. Myth number one, I already kind of blew this one out of the water. If I practice 10,000 hours, I can become a professional musician and go to Carnegie Hall. In fact, un unfortunately for us, uh, there was a study done at the Berlin Academy of Music where they have that famous orchestra that they recognized that by age 20, their academy musicians, their youngsters would leave and have about 10,000 hours of practice under their belt. Yeah, we all know where that came from. It's from there. But Who's to say that, you know, Joe Smith didn't waste 9,500 of them because he was actually thinking about like his girl problems in his practice room. You know what I mean? Like just the idea of practicing in quantity is unfair. And if anyone ever tries to use that against you, just don't listen to it because they're trying to hurt you and that ain't cool. That ain't right. All right. Anybody got time for that? I, I, anybody got time for that? Practice what you can. Practice what makes you happy. What gives you joy. The second myth, he or she is way more talented than me. So why bother? I give up. I'm terrible. I'm never going to be as good as blank. 
Anyone that's ever sat in the violin section has thought this, I promise you. Um, talent is fictional. Talent is overrated. I come back to the book I just pointed out. Read the book if you've ever had that thought. I promise you, it is fictional. Hard work and talent are extremes. Just because you put time in doesn't mean you're gonna be better. Just because you're talented, you're amazingly automatically like God's gift to music. Extremes, what is in the middle? What drives success? And what this book talks about is deliberate practice. Using your time efficiently and focusing on the things you need to. Does it sound familiar? We've already covered that. It's what this book covers and, it, and he's not even talking, it's not even a music book. He's talking about an athlete, a musician and a businessman. That's not a music book, but it's, it's, it's actually one of the best selling business books of all time because it talks about efficient use of time. How can I get to optimal performance conditions? Remember that business idea? How can I get to optimal performance conditions in the shortest amount of time possible? So please do not believe the idea that someone is simply biologically better than you at music. Now, if someone has a perfect pitch or they have photographic memory, okay, that's one thing they have on you, but guess what they may not have? The idea of deliberate practice. The idea that you're in balance. Because guess what, maybe you spent two hours a day playing, but it's the best two hours of practice and by the end of the week, you've grown so much as a human, but they don't know how to practice. Does that mean that they're better than you? No, stop believing that someone is simply better than you. Number three, I started too late, I can only be this good, whatever this good means to you. False, says who? And now that being said, as kids, we absorb the most information, that is true. Our brains are developing, we absorb things like sponges. Just look at languages as an example. But that doesn't mean that when we're like, stop being kids, we stop living all of a sudden. No, we still like are living our daily lives. We can still do things. Guess what, have you ever heard of the retiree who like picked up three habits or like three new activities and hobbies and he's like really good at them? There's a reason, balance of mind. Got rid of work, added hobby. Guess what he's good at now? So please do not believe that I started too late. It's just not true. By the way, I mentioned Joe Smith wasting 9,000 hours of practice. So he started at age eight, but by age 40, he's put in 20,000 hours of practice and only four of them mattered. Okay, so you, you didn't start too late. You just didn't. The last thing, I bombed my last blank number of auditions. Therefore, I am terrible and simply not growing as a musician. False. What you may not have had is balance and self-awareness. If you have had any issues of auditions and audition situations, that's another topic we're going to cover on Monday. But please don't let that be a deterrent for practicing in a fun way, in a happy way. Music is not driven by results, it's driven by the joy of why we do it every day. Again, if you win the audition, what do you do the next day? Do you practice? You know, see what I mean? It's not a goal audition thing. So let the process drive your happiness. You will be a better musician and you will come to auditions happier. The people that have won the most auditions in my experience that I've talked to, it's because they finally stopped trying to win auditions. They started focusing on enjoying what they're doing or they like just gave up and quit and they were like, you know what, I'm just gonna do it. Famous example, my conducting teacher quit conducting. Quit conducting, that's correct. And then two months later was offered a job at Cincinnati Conservatory. He quit, he gave up because of this myth number four. I'm terrible as a conductor, I have not won any auditions. Guess what probably happened for him? He was trying to do what? Control too much. Now he was also known for being like super aggressive and angry and on the podium and like in lessons. So I think it really was this kind of control thing, but we're not gonna talk about that anyway. But that may be what was driving it, okay? So I hope that this was helpful. There are key things I, I kept trying to repeat over and over, hint, hint, like a good study session, um, is the idea of balance. It's the idea of quality over quantity. Practice things that make you happy work them into your practice time, um, play things that build you as a person, that interest you. Don't just play the things you have to, okay? I, I, we've already covered all of these things. Um, I'm gonna come back to the um, Excel thing one more time because I wanna point out just a few books and then I'll send you on your way. 
Um, these are all the links to the sources that I used for here, up to here. If you want to check them out, I highly encourage this one, The Bulletproof Musician. musician. The reason why, the whole Shostakovich study I, where I got that info from is from this site. So uh, go check it out. He's got, he's got a great um, website and a blog. His name is Noah Kagayama, and I put his podcast link right there. So he's the same guy that does Bulletproof Musician. Check it out. Super cool dude. Um, he's Juilliard trained, so he knows all about imbalance. Anyway, uh, just kidding. Uh, and then the books I put here, I already mentioned The Art of Practicing. Very good book. Just talks a lot about the phys philosophical approach to like just life, basically. Another great book that's not about music, but is a really good book that may help you with balance is The Zen in the Art of Archery. Great series of books, but check it out. The other book that's really, really good, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, available for $0 on Amazon Prime or 49 cents. Knowledge. And then the last one, uh, sorry, the last two. I don't have Dick Couch's book here. Um, those of you that know me know that before I was in music, I was working in, in the government and was trained to be a Navy SEAL. Those of you that know me know that very well. Um, but there's a lot of things that I take with me from that part of my life into music. This book was inspiring on so many levels. Read it if you need a, a motivating pick-me-up or like you just want to be like challenged. It is a great book. Um, talks about how they train, why they train, their mindset, their approach. Another great book about that is called The Way of the Seal. Um, I haven't put that in this uh, thing, but it's another great one that I really enjoy. If you want that title, let me know. Um, but, and the last one I did, I just put in here, the biography of Baron Boy I mentioned earlier. Um, so yeah, I hope that this was helpful. I hope that this also helped you reframe, reframe some things in your mind about what practice is um, and what it can be. Um, Andrew, I just caught a glimpse of what you wrote and I wanna to touch on it really quickly. Uh, because you said a lot of prepositions do not start until later in their growing process. And I think that's very true because a lot of us finally learn these lessons, I think, and we finally start enjoying what we're doing. And that's when we grow. Um, so I think just enjoy it, folks. That's the message from today. Um, yeah, and I'm, I, there's so many things to read here that I'm going to try to respond to each one of you and all the things that you have written me. Um, but yeah. I hope this was helpful. Does anyone have any questions or comments or clarifications or anything like that before we get off the Zoom? Anyone? You can type it. I have a comment. Sure, Josh. Yeah, the comment I made all that you might see is that like, it's best to challenge yourself because it has to become better. Okay. It's like something I say, you say, okay, I might do that every three days so it's starting to become better. That's the person like Serena Phoenix, two of the two famous tennis players, one of the best. Yeah, and the world. And you know, challenging, challenging yourself means something different to all of us. So, you know, again, it's depending on your goals, depending on what you want to get out of it. I like to challenge myself a lot. I do have a bit of an extremist personality, hence why I wanted to be an Navy SEAL and hence why I am a conductor. I, that's just who I am. But I like to push myself a lot, like a lot further than I think a lot of people do, just because I can't not do that. I need that growth. I need that like, ugh. but that may not be you and that's okay. Just be true to who you are. Shakespeare said it best, right folks? Just be true to who you are. That's modern English, not the old English, but yeah, good comment, Josh, good comment. Um, anyone else? No, you, you guys know where to reach me. If you have anything you wanna talk about outside of this, like in a public setting, if you wanna just talk to me about practice or about you know balance or about anything like that, I am very open with my own struggles about how like much I do overcome still about motivation and inspiration and practice. It's a daily thing. It never leaves you. But if you want to talk about it, I would be glad to. If you want any more specific practice tips 
or if you want to talk about anything more specifically in the Excel sheet, like any of these tips that may not make a lot of sense, um, just please like just reach out. I'd be so happy to talk to any one of you. Uh, that would make my day. So with that being said, thank you so much. I know we went over a few minutes. Um, thank you so much for tuning in for, for just hanging out and enjoying this. I hope it was helpful. And until next time, folks, on Monday, we're going to cover audition prep and the dreaded world of auditions slash like seating exercises slash whatever you want to call them and how they're actually not that full of baggage, just like practice. Hey. So um, until then, get, get to some fun music stuff. I hope you just go and this has inspired you to just go play whatever you want to play on your instrument after this. I know I will. Just go have some fun, enjoy yourselves, and just en enjoy the music, folks. Um, I will talk to you all next time. I will see you on Monday. Until then, everyone, be safe, be happy, be healthy, and I will see you later.